project manager at BuzzFeed. Our next panelist is Alexis Rice. She is the strategic partner manager for YouTube. And our final panelist tonight is hip hop entertainer and entrepreneur whose latest album is called Victory Lap, Nipsey Hussle. I'm not used to sitting down, this chair is throwing me off. I'll tell you that right now. So uh, tonight is going to be very, very simple. What we're going to do is have a question and answer session here. We're going to have a lively discussion, um, particularly about utilizing tech as a platform to enhance your media brand. After our discussion, we'll have the floor open for a few questions. I will do my best to dart up and down those stairs and not hurt myself and make sure that we get to have a lively discussion. I'm going to take a seat. I apologize. It's antithetical for me to sit down during one of these discussions. It's just awesome. And I'm going to grab one of these cards for you. I'm going to hand that to you because we're going to be handing this back and forth all night. So I start with easy questions and then we get difficult. Uh, the easy one is a softball. Uh, how has technology enhanced your career? Well, since I have the mic, is it on? All right. Because I really don't need it. Um, <laughs> How it has it enhanced my career? Well, um, I entered tech four years ago um, after the, the, I'm the only child and my dad passed away and literally I thought all my life that would kill me. When it didn't, I had some decisions to make. And so I was an educator and I hated your kids. So it was time for me, <laughs> it's time for me to get out of the school system. And so I was like, I knew I was more than a consumer of tech but I wasn't, no one was talking about being a producer of tech. So I was like, oh, my dad left me some money, let me figure this thing out. And I started developing, but then I realized that a lot of you people don't have a lot of skills beyond tech, um, beyond coding, and the skills that I have, uh, which I call human-centric skills. And um, so I figured out, hey, this community, although it thinks it's very innovative, it's really not. So I'm going to have to really work on teaching this community what my value is, because I refuse to let tech tell me what my value was. So last year, I spoke at 19 conferences, keynote at five worldwide. Um, I started hashtag cause the scene because I am so sick of people. <sighs> mm, I'm sick of white supremacy. I'm just gonna say it. And I'm sick of white supremacy in tech, and um, I'm calling out white people to do more. And that's what, um, that's what I do. And so on Twitter is where my home is, and you will see me calling them out 24 7. So, and I have a following. I'm like, they like it, so I go with it. <laughs> Can I say I like you? Also, please don't no stop. Oh, no, I never will. It's like me money. I'm good. <laughs> I, I love making them uncomfortable. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, the question is, uh, how does technology like, I mean, enhance your career? Uh, so, probably around nine years ago, eight or nine years ago, uh, I was washing dishes at a restaurant called Tompkins for a Grill in Los Angeles. Um, and following that, I learned um, technology and, and tools changed the way, has like, completely changed my life, whether it was through production, um, learning uh, how to use Final Cut. Uh, or you know, a suite of editing software, which got me like my first jobs and got me uh, out of that place. Um, to you know, meeting different people, learning how different things work, different things interact. Uh, it's like it's life changing, I would say. Um, also life changing for me as I work at one of the largest, or probably the largest, um, technology companies in the world as part of Google. But for me, the transition from traditional media to technology was really rooted in data and rooted in the research I was doing at the time around kids' viewing habits. When I looked at kind of how kids were watching television or teenagers, how they were interacting with social media and their phones, all the data pointed towards this really dramatic shift towards more technologically-based platforms. And so as somebody who is passionate about entertainment, I knew that that was a path I also had to follow. So I made the transition to Google 
and as somebody who doesn't have a coding background or isn't necessarily a technical person, really found my path by kind of being a translator between the business and technical sides. Um, so I'm still learning. I still sometimes say I work in computers, um, which isn't accurate, but um, it is a space that I love. Um, I'm in the music industry, so I think everybody is aware of how much technology and just the digital revolution has impacted how the music industry the business is running. So for me, it was like going from selling a CD to selling a, a song or a digital version of the CD and then going from selling a digital version to um, the streaming economy. So I just, my generation experienced the change from CD to um, digital songs to streaming. And we had to build a brand during each one of those transitional periods. And even just from um, the main source of income, it used to be an uh, album sale in music. That's changed because of the impact that technology has made. Now, you get less off the music, you get more off the ancillary items. Like if you, if you build a merch salon or you got a big touring company or business, you know, that surrounds the music thing you're doing. So I, I say the biggest way it's impacting me is just how we go about trying to make money off the music because that thing has been disrupted and it's changing so fast in the era that we've been putting out music. But I mean, even outside of that, you know how we promote ourselves on Instagram and the whole social network thing. So um, my field has been dramatically impacted by technology and people that embraced it and creating got, you know, a little original with it, had the, had the advantage on everybody else. Um, so yeah. So talk to me a little bit about when you realized that technology was a fundamental brand building tool. There's a second part of this question. What was the first thing you did to utilize it once you realized it was important? <laughs> okay, so, say last year I spoke at these conferences, everybody wants to fly me around and talk about inclusion diversity, how they improve their businesses because they realize they're leaving money on the table, da 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 no one wants to pay. So at the end of last year, I was just pissed. I mean, I was just like, I'm so sick of this, nobody wants to pay, it's just lip service. So my friend and I went on the phone and I was like, you know what, in 2018 I want to be disrupted. And so we just started talking about, I, was like, I just want to cause a scene. Hashtag cause a scene, okay, let's see what happens with that. So I started just dropping that in on Twitter and seeing what happens. And people started galvanizing around it. And it became an official thing on International Women's Day. And I knew I had something when I, my talk at International Women's Day was why aren't all women making gains in tech? And white women were not happy when I was finished. Yeah. But the, they were very uncomfortable. And the black women came to me with tears in their eyes and were hugging me because I knew I got the message right, I was like, that is it for me. And I've been going ever since. It's, it's, it's that, my friend said, Kim, you were saying the same thing last year. What changed? Putting the strategy behind what I was doing is what changed it for me. And the hashtag called the scene was the first part of me putting all of my background into a strategy and moving forward. Um, for me, I think, uh, one of my first opportunities was working with an early YouTube partner. Uh, it's called the Philip Franco Show. Um, and I had the opportunity to see how, um, how YouTube changed the way that we consume and distribute content and the importance of that, uh, the importance of tech as like a, a delivery platform. Or, um, yeah, so that was my first uh, experience with that, following that I worked uh, for a small startup and we worked with another YouTube partner um, to create marketing content which went super viral uh, but also didn't make us any money. Uh, so I learned that um, it can enhance some things but um, it came to everything. For me it started a lot long time ago when I was working at Lucasfilm, the company that produces Star Wars and Indiana Jones. And I was part of the team that launched or uh, relaunched StarWars.com. And before that, as a brand, we really maintained kind of ownership of the property we had of Insight, 
our annual celebration, which was for our fans. We had a magazine, but it was really a one-way conversation where we were, we were telling people, here's kind of what's the latest and greatest with Star Wars. And when we opened up that funnel of StarWars.com and kicked off things like our Star Wars fan festival, that's when we really started to have the kind of continuous two-way dialogue. And as a brand person and marketer at the time, it was remarkable how much we were able to grow the brand outside of the theatrical window, having that two-way conversation and being able to tap into our biggest fans through technology to kind of be a partner with us throughout the off-season of the theatrical release. So it really opened my eyes to the power of that conversation and how fans um, can drive it the next level for a brand. Um, I think when, when blogs first popped up, when, when the blog thing started becoming something, um, I had a partner that um, he was a little more educated uh, just in that space, and he was telling me that, you know, they got these websites that critique music, and, you know, I used to sell my CDs and my music out my trunk. That's where I grew up, um, studying Jay-Z and studying Master P or studying the independent successes from the generation before mine, and it was all about, you know, creating your own distribution, um, taking advantage of your immediate surroundings and just being super local and you know owning your own territory and then this blog thing popped off and you could be global your music could instantly be everywhere and they had um you know certain genres of blogs they had hip-hop blogs rock blogs etc tech blogs pet blogs everything but the dude showed me that you know bro you put your song up here and i'm like nah that's like leaking the record you know you don't want to put the music out just because my entire mentality was like hoard the music and um, obviously the whole band became sharing and became, you know, putting your stuff in front of as many eyeballs as possible. But I just remember that combo and him having to educate me and say, no, this is good, this is gonna build a brand, it's gonna build a demand for the album that we end up putting at traditional retail. And I trust him. And you know, we got booked for shows, we start getting um, requests for interviews, and it just created a whole income outside the traditional, which is CD at Best Buy, Target, wait for the album to drop. There was a whole other model that he turned me on to. I think that was my first exposure to the benefits of it, you know. One more thing I want to talk about YouTube is because that's when I knew the power of the, the web to positively affect marginalized communities. Anytime I want to know something, I have every website I've built has been has I copy YouTube video. Every time I want to know about keto, whatever, I copy a YouTube video. Uh, or it has made access to information that was only held in that. So I'm a generation where every household had a um, if you could afford it the encyclopedia, which means information never changed. It was like static. You know, what was in those 26 volumes was all we knew. Now, I could get that in a day of going down a rabbit hole. And that was like, I can do something with this. And I think that's one of the things we're most proud of on the platform is that ability to give everyone a voice and show them the world. And that's why I transitioned from traditional media to YouTube because I got tired of working at a TV studio where every year we rolled out the same sitcom featuring the same kind of traditional American family versus on YouTube where you can see comedy shows, you can see dramatic shows featuring people who look like us. And giving people that voice is one piece of the equation at YouTube, but also showing them the world. So giving everybody access to that same set of information, whether it's how to build a website, how to better do an Excel spreadsheet, or how to learn how to tie a bow tie, all of those resources are available to everyone free on YouTube. Just sort of like following on that, I do think that um, it also sort of begs the question, uh, how do we consume this content, how do we teach people to consume this content? Um, because we are in this awesome age where, as you say, there's all this information, there's all this uh, exciting um, entertainment uh, that we have access to. Um, but I think especially today, um, we should also maybe be thinking about um, how do we teach people to consume the content, how do we teach people to um, 
uh, to be like, to discriminate, yeah. yes, <laughs> and evaluate. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, so it's just, a, <laughs> just like the yeah. thing about. Yeah. And something we think about as a platform as well, you know, recent announcements we've made around Google News, for example, making sure that we give it viewers information on the source of that news is something that's really critical. And I work really closely with our YouTube Kids app, so they're making sure we're giving kids information on content that is safe for them, and making sure we're giving parents access to the tools to make sure their kids are watching content they think is appropriate. I want to follow up on something that you said, Nipsey. Uh, earlier, you talked a little bit about how you were doing you know, your research, that you kind of followed the steps of Jay-Z and Master P when you started selling your records. Um, talk to me a little bit about sort of that instinct, like that digital strategy. Um, how did you know that it was right to go down that path of sort of doubling down on digital strategy? And that's kind of for everybody. Was it more of that instinct? Was it research-based? Was it experiential because you worked in a field and you just saw it was going? What, what led you to sort of say, I, this is absolutely the path we should be going down? Um, I got introduced to it, like I said earlier, by somebody I was working with. He just on recording songs that was in the studio working with me. And he just knew a little bit about this thing that was happening online. And once I saw it, my, my instinct kicked in. Uh, you know, you, it's just kind of like you, you peep the opportunity and your brain start, dang, this is, you can do a lot with this, you know? We didn't really have a, um, a model fully built at that moment, but you can see the potential. And you can see, you know, wow, um, imagine what could happen if you can get your music to millions of people without this middleman. You know, without these gatekeepers, if you can get your content. And then, you know, like you was talking about um, evaluation. You know, what what is the process of things getting noticed? How do things get noticed? Is it is it just the good stuff just gets noticed because it's good? And this thing like going viral wasn't even a term back then, but all of them uh, potentials, I think, you, you kind of felt it when you, still, when you first looked at it, like all of these things could happen. So embrace it, let's just try it out. And we start putting music out, putting videos out and doing interviews and what we learned later was just content. We start putting content out, taking advantage of this platform. And, you know, what I start to see is that these online reactions are real people. Cause I'll be in the real world. I'll be in New York or at a party or somewhere at an event and somebody will be like, I run this blog and I also got this um, relationship with this clothing line and we can do something and connect the two and I start seeing you know, this is this thing is real. It's not just a virtual, yeah. you know, space that represent some random group of people. This real people are online doing things, and it's only gonna get bigger. Um, and then we start making money off of it too. That's always the, you know, at the end of the day, that's the bottom line of business is to make money. So, you know, um, you just seen. I saw a big opportunity and wanted to just be proactive and start. Learn through trial and error how to embrace it. Yeah. For me, it was um, definitely trial and error because, um, as a black woman growing up in the South, I was told I was always too loud, I was too ladylike, I was this, I was that. Um, yeah, girl, mm. I said, if one more person with a penis told me I wasn't being ladylike, I was going to scream. I was like, dudes. Um, so, Having the internet <laughs> and an app was liberation for me. I can get on Twitter and say whatever I feel. As long as I'm willing to deal with the consequences, you can't shut me up. And that for women, <laughs> particularly black women, if you see the hashtags now, vote like black women, support black women, amplify black women, affirm black women, we have been saying this for years, but we didn't have the microphone. Now we have the microphone, and you cannot shut us up. And that has been so liberating. It has been like standing in the face of white supremacy and saying, now what you gonna do? Yes. And so it has, it has been life affirming for me. Everything I, I was not the child my mom thought she was gonna be here. I'm just going to be honest. Don't go in the woods, Kim, man. There's something in the woods she don't want me to see, so let me go in the woods. That's the kind of kid I was. So that's what I'm bringing to hashtag positive. So I've been doing it all along. Um, I think, uh, so 
So, um, I think for me, uh, I don't want to the question, I'm sorry, I'm so um, terrible. Uh, no, you're right. I was asking, um, essentially, how did you know to get in sync your research that told you that this, this sort of digital platform of working in the digital space was where you needed to be? Um, so when I started working on the Fourth of Franco show, really two partner, um, I got an internship somehow. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, I just emailed them, like them. Um, and I think at that time, I really felt like this is the future of television, um, or the future of entertainment. And I know, you know, 2010, 2011 was one of those first articles we first started talking about, oh, uh, like, is TV dead? And that was a little bit premature, but um, as technology has improved, as like, uh, our phones can handle more data, as we do more things with our phones, um, uh, yeah, I suppose I feel, I feel like vindicated, uh, but I, I really felt at that time like, whoa, here's this new, accessible platform. Anybody can do anything they want. Um, anybody can do, uh, can experiment. Every community has access to things that speak to them. Um, especially in a time where, uh, I, can't even, I can't even think of like a diverse to come in 2009, 2010, right? Um, so having an opportunity to be able to connect with, um, with things that speak to you, even if you just like, I don't know, Watching people be tickled, right? Whatever, like some weird thing. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, for me, it was a combo of both. Both the data showing that you know viewers were moving to these platforms, and if I wanted to stay in entertainment, those were the platforms where I needed to be. Um, but also the changing business climate as well. So I worked for one of the larger movie studios, and I would come to New York a couple times a year to defend against those articles talking about TV audiences disappearing. And every time I walked into the boardroom, they would say, oh, you're tall, and I think, and I'm also a black woman. Is that what you're really trying to comment on with my presence in the room? And you know, after so many times of being told how tall I was every time I entered an executive room, I just decided maybe I don't need to be the lone spokesperson who's here kind of showing you the future of media um, and moving to a platform like YouTube where I am better represented represented certainly on the screen, but also among my colleagues, um, has been a great move. I want to follow up on that a little bit. You've all talked about knowing that the digital was the future. It was, you could see the industries you were in moving in that way. Um, I'm curious, let's talk a little bit about sort of brand, your story and the brand. That you, when you're building a brand, how do you use your digital strategy when you know this is where you're heading and you want to position yourself in that space? How do you use digital to help control your narrative? How do you use it to control the story you want to tell to the audience that you're talking to? So for me, um, excuse me. So hashtag cause the scene is, or my digital presence is funds or brings clients to my business. Um, so I'm very specific. I used to be intentional, but intention without strategy is chaos. And so it gets out. Say that again. They need to that again. Intention without strategy is chaos. Let me give you an example. People say, oh, I intend to do. So you go down that road, and then you go down the rabbit hole of that road. And you, but when you have a strategy, you can say, you can discern, although that's interesting, it's not where I need to go. So I'm going to stay here. Um, so if anyone follows me, they will see that I like to gaslight people. Particularly if you come in my, my feed, my timeline, and start, yeah, and starting something, and you have not done your homework of at least reading some of the stuff that I've written about, this is going to be fun. So it's like a mouse. But some people I don't bother with. So I know my lane is in tech. Tech is. It's not as liberal as it thinks it is, but it's more left-leaning than most um, industries. Or, well, that can't be say industries because we're across everything, but most professions. So, um, I'm not going to argue with a Nazi. I'm not going to argue with a um, Ku Klux Klan. I mean, what's the point there? And the people that I gaslight, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for the white folks who follow me so they can see I don't have the same experience you're having. That's the, the misnomer. They think we're all, no, we're not having the same experience. 
This is what I have to deal with every single day. And if I'm uncomfortable, I want to make you as uncomfortable as I possibly make you so you can get off your butt and get to work. So today I had, I had a, whew, a, a good 30 minute session with somebody and they always have these avatars that mean absolutely nothing. And they're calling me a racist and I'm just laughing, just like, oh yeah, you idiot. And, I'm, and they're saying, I'm not a thinker. Now, mind you, I have dropped 10 articles in the thread that talk about white feminism, all this, but I'm not a thinker. This is not for you. This is for the people who are watching you make a fool out of yourself. And also, my white audience knows when they come after me, it is their responsibility to go after them, because it's not my job to do, it's their work to do. And they'll eventually say something racist, and I'm like, Thank you, all it took was some time and pressure. Thank you for the free marketing, good luck. And I'm done, and they get so pissed. I'm like, my strategy's done, what are, you, what are you talking about? They don't get it, and I just see them all time and time again implode on Twitter. Because they're, while I have a strategy, they're being themselves out in a global community and not being aware of, particularly where in tech, is a small community there are people, although you may have an avatar that's not you, there are people in our community who know how to find who you are. And it happens all the time. And so that is how I, I'm very intentional about what I do because, like I've got my keynotes tomorrow. My, my talk is not for, um, that's preaching to the choir. What I'm gonna be doing is giving you a demonstration of how I talk to the white people in my office. That they have to do this work. We cannot do this work. So I need to train them, get them ready, and every time something bad happens, and I'm so I was so happy about Kavanaugh. Woo! They were so upset. I was like, good. Now you see that everybody's not living like you. After I, I couldn't have these conversations before Trump because I would. We live in a post-racial. We had a president for eight years. Ago. <laughs> We dealt with racism in the 60s. What are you talking about, Kim? Why is everything about race? What are you? I had, they have to see it. They have to be as uncomfortable as possible, and that is what I do. I make them as uncomfortable as I possibly can, and then say, hey, you can pay me to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> I really just want to drop this mic. <laughs> <laughs> So I think uh, for me, and possibly in the context of BuzzFeed as well, uh, you know, technology, the tech factor doesn't exist without the editorial, doesn't exist without the content, um, and, and tech really is just a, a way to not only deliver the content, but also to measure the way it performs, and also the great thing about this is um, the in, uh, interactivity, so like people can come, you can actually see what the consumers of your content. Your mic's too close. Uh, thanks. Um, like right here? Yes. Okay. So uh, you can, um, you, know, you know, you can solicit feedback directly. You can solicit feedback and adjust on the fly. Um, I think one of the things I've learned, I keep coming back to you too. One of the things I remember uh, was the advice that they content creators was make your content episodic, be consistent, um, show up week to week at the same time, uh, learn what your audience is saying, tweak based on that. Um, so I think uh, those are the ways that uh, we use, we try to use technology to control a brand, control the narrative. Um, yeah. I think YouTube is a great example of being able to build that brand through technology. And um, one case study I would just point to is a partner I work with called My Froggy Stuff. It was started by a mother and daughter whose husband was serving overseas in the military. And while he was gone, they obviously were living on a fixed budget and started making videos around creating doll crafts. It was something they were passionate about and did as a family and became very popular and um, built a strong following on YouTube. So we're able to use technology to build that brand as kind of crafters and family bloggers. But then when the Black Panther movie came out and Mattel hadn't made a Black Panther Barbie or any toys associated with the movie, they actually gave instructions on how to create a Shuri doll. And it was so popular and, you know, even Mattel took notice. And now they're in a position to start their own toy line. 
So those are the cases where I love how technology has allowed a family to not only follow their passion, but actually reinvest back in um, tangible goods. So now they're going to be making toys um, and really have built a brand around what their family believes in. So a really powerful story of how kind of tech enabled that. Um, for me, it was about telling the same story that we told previously just through video and song and whatever publications you've done interviews with, and now telling that story across 15 new platforms, YouTube being one of them, IG being one, um, Twitter, all these different platforms, they all require a different type of content, in my opinion. You know, some of them got a parameter how long the content could be, like you only get 60 seconds on IG, so you can't put a three minute video that you put on YouTube on your IG, and just, Thinking about how that impacted your strategy and thinking like that, do I need to sit with my videographer and say, what can we do in 60 seconds? Mm -hmm. We got to go about it thinking that this is a 60 second piece of content. We got to tell this whole story in 60 seconds. But it has to connect back to the video that goes on YouTube for the whole three minutes. And also got to connect back to what you're doing on IG. And so it just became um, about figuring out how to tell a story across multiple platforms that all have different um, languages, even though it's not literally the language difference, but they have a different communication format. And so I think the people that figured that out and how to be really creative on each platform, I think have a stronger brand online and, you know, seem like the leaders, you know, in the space. And I, after like approaching it like that, we start to, as creators, we start to feel like networks. Just like you said about the program and showing up consistently on every Wednesday at this time, I think that we start looking at ourselves as HBO or as you know one of these um, networks that their job is to program content and, and make hit pieces of content that engage people and have come back. And that seemed like the business we in now, you know, because of all of these new platforms. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I would agree with that. I feel that I'm a media company um, because I have a podcast, I do a conference, I do all these things, and and you're right. Every platform tells a consistent story in a different way, and it further amplifies the the message and the voice. Um, so yeah, I see myself as two different businesses: the business of content creation, which drives the business strategist part um, of what I do, of helping yeah, build, build businesses that don't discriminate or cause harm and that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I think it's two strategies. I think, like you said, you got the creative strategy, what the actual content is going to be, and then you got a strategy of how you get it out. And, and what you do matters. when you get it out, because like you said, the, the, um, the, um, the comments. Like, I've been in, Okay, I'm Okay, I've been in Stack Overflows, but for a few months. Who, raise your hand if you know tech, okay, tech. Because they keep coming out with a survey every year and pretending like everybody filled out that survey when 93% are white males between the ages of 18 and 34 years old. So now companies are using this survey or this platform. So if you don't know Stack Overflow is, it's where developers go to get questions asked. It is a toxic place for people who are not white males, ages 18 to 34. So now companies, HR departments, because they're lazy, are when you go into an interview are asking what's your stack overflow score, because it's like gamified, you get points. Well, we miss out because it's not safe for us to ask questions on them. Most of us will go look at copy and paste answers and get back off. Because to ask those jerks a question, you don't even want to be bothered. But that's not the global developer community, and I've been on, you cannot market this as the global developer community. What this is, what you can say is, our, our, our customers, who are ages 18 to 34, white guys, this is how they answer this question. And um, that is an issue, because they don't know how to respond, and, they have, and, and what they have not gotten is, had they responded to me when I first brought up the concerns, I wouldn't have anything to say. But the more you ignore me, man, it's gold. Yeah. 
I could just drop something today, and my whole thing, my whole um, following will start start on stack on the phone again. It's like, dudes, all you have to do is respond, but people don't have mechanisms or a strategy for that. And I say all the time, lack of inclusion is a risk management issue. At some point, you're going to start getting sued for this stuff. We're, and one of the issues I have with Stack Overflow is because only white guys, ages 18 to 34, okay, I'm not going to say only that, so absolutely, mostly. Now people are using this code to program AI, machine learning, and deep learning with biased, racist code. This is a problem. I have a serious problem with that because now you're harming a global community which you don't have a right to harm. And so until they sit down with me and have a conversation, I'm going to keep bringing it up because you don't have a right to do that. But again, it's a part of my strategy because I'm hashtag all the scene and people expect me to go in the room and just mess up stuff. That is a good feeling. <laughs> I think there's the disruption piece, which I so appreciate and value, because to your point, this is the pipeline that is building the future. But it's that pipeline piece that I think is where we really need to spend more time investing. And that's where I question if Stack Overflow isn't the right resource, where is the resource where people can go to get answers to those questions? And that's where I think we have a responsibility, those of us working in tech, to continue to build those resources and make it a space where people feel comfortable to ask. So that would be my one request to all of you is to ask the questions, get the resources and find the information you need. Because it is such an intimidating industry that it feels like we can never get in. But once you start asking those basic questions, you start to realize pretty quickly there's space and more than enough that needs to be done. That's just making that first headway in. Actually, that just brings us a lot to like, I guess we don't necessarily have the luxury of having things good, right? Um, yeah, that's all. That's just Not if you're doing stuff that needs to be fixed. We all need to be learning and growing and, and moving. This is no longer the industrial age, this is the information age. If you're not creating knowledge, you're in the way. And you can't create knowledge by not making mistakes and learn from it. And that's why the Facebook is missing it, because all they thought was um, fail fast, fail hard. Where was fail fast, stop, and learn from what we failed at? and use that to, into the next strategies. And this is where people of color, we're very empathetic because we've had to learn how to do this. Let's be honest, as much as they say we're at a disadvantage, we're actually at an advantage because we've learned how to m manipulate or move in within them, their systems. They have no idea how to move outside of their systems. And their systems are breaking down. It's privilege and white supremacy is like a parasite and it's now eaten on its host. We gonna survive. <laughs> We're gonna survive. They don't know how. And that's why every time there's some major thing, they freak out and we're looking sitting there like, what are you talking about? Calm down. It's gonna be okay. I just love you so much. <laughs> I want to ask a little bit, um, we've talked a little bit about, um, everyone uh, sort of agreed on the panel that content creation is now really a part of what you do. Um, let's talk a little bit about when you're doing content creation, it usually involves not just yourself, but other individuals or teams that you have to build or partners that you bring on board. How, how do you see, like what do you see as the biggest challenge in building sort of that infrastructure to make that content? And how do you identify who could be a strong partner, who could be a strong team member. How do you how do you identify the best folks to do that kind of work with you? Okay, so my situation is different because I um, I don't play none of these folks. Um, if you believe in what I do, then you need to be offering the help. So for my podcast, before I had an editor, uh, editor I never went back and listened to the thing. I threw an intro and an outro on it and kept it moving. My brain don't work that I gotta go back and edit it and everything. So someone in my community says, hey Kim, I wanna edit this for you. He sent me a mic, cause oh, he's like, oh, you sound real good now with the mic. He listened to it, he, uh, he uh, um, edits it, he's, and we have now a break in between, all kinds of fancy stuff. <laughs> um, 
I, my current website I built on YouTube as a web, WordPress website. I have people in the community who's like, Kim, I want to help you out. Now I'm like a, a, a person who's in charge of the web, I have a front end guy, a back end person, and an intern who's working, not paying any of them, but they believe in what I'm doing. So my thing is, is different, but you, okay, I also have a legal white man. Okay, let me explain this. Okay. So a legal white man, yeah, 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 is, um, I don't believe in people calling, first of all, you can't call yourself an ally. Only the, the groups that work, that you work on behalf of can say if the work you're doing is worth being called an ally. So um, I have a legal white man. I'm not doing this work. They need to be doing this work. So my job is, their, my, their job is to make themselves uncomfortable so that I'm comfortable. So if my laptop breaks down, somebody in this group needs to give me a laptop. Um, if I need a connection from some, somewhere, someone in that group needs to get, get me connected. Because white people need to be doing this work. I, I, I'm bringing content, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm out on this panel, I'm, not in, I'm in Minnesota when it's cold. Somebody needs to be doing some work. <laughs> I left in that, it was 80 degrees, I was not happy. Um, I do not go above the Mason-Dixon after a certain part of the year, and this is just crazy. Um, so that's how mine is different, but, but I don't take on anybody. They have to know, if you screw up, you're going to get criticized, and you might get criticized in public, and do not slide into my DMs about a public conversation I'm having on Twitter. You will get your feelings hurt, because I will screenshot it and embarrass you out in public. Yeah, that's why people get, no, you don't get to do that. Um, so, for me, it's about, I, because it's me and I'm talking about things that could jeopardize my life, I have to feel safe. My safety is, is important. And if you, again, if cannot make yourself uncomfortable, for me, I have absolutely no use for you. I tell them why people follow me every day. I'm not looking for followers, I'm not looking for fans. If you can't make yourself uncomfortable, for me, I have absolutely no use for you. So that's how I get the best talent. Well. Um. <laughs> I know, it's a good one. And there you go. Uh, I don't know, this is... Um, we should change the word, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I <laughs> I promise I'll make her go last next time. I promise. <laughs> um, I was specifically wanting to know about how you build in the content creation that you're doing. How do you build the teams? How do you find people that you that you trust to do this work? How do you identify people that are good partners? You know, in order to build the infrastructure you need to keep this going. Because I know for you in particular that you you do a lot of your work solo, but a lot of the rest of you work with organizations and you build the team. How do you go about finding the right people? Um, I think it's like building a championship basketball, baseball, football team. You, you might not get everybody on the first season, but as you, you know, you got different seasons, you've been in the game for a while, you've been working, you build your team, and you run into great people, and you run into people like, to her point, that believe in what you're doing. And, you know, it might be a more beneficial opportunity that they're really passionate about what you're doing, and they believe in it, and they want to be a part of taking this to the next level. Um, yeah, it's just, I think, being consistent and doing something that has a high vibration, it attract good people also. People want to get behind causes that they feel like making a difference and, you know, have, you know, uh, beneficial qualities and make a big contribution. But, like I said, I think it's just a process, honestly. You don't start with the 96 Bulls. I don't think nobody up there can say that started off with the championship squad. It was on the court taking their shots and making their layups and their free throws. And from there, you know, people want to play for the team and you get some resources and um, hopefully manage everything right to build something that, you know, is sustainable. But when I think about how I got a team that I consider as a great team around me, it was being in the field and, and showing up and being a proven act that's gonna work and it's gonna deliver. You know what I mean? On a great moment and also a challenging moment. Somebody that's known to be, he's gonna, he gonna drop product every year, he's gonna be on the road, he's gonna be consistent. And um, 
Yeah, I think in my case, that's what it's about, being consistent. I don't get the luxury to choose my partners in my role, but um, I can think of some examples of people who I think do a really well, good job. And one person I manage is Lizelle Green, and I think she has a couple attributes that really make her stand out and have made her have a legacy on YouTube and beyond. First is curiosity. Like you said, she understands that each platform is different and she needs to have a different voice and a different message on each platform. But like you mentioned, being able to tailor that message um, in your content is actually really difficult. The 60 second story is not easy. And so just going out there and learning from other creators, um, she's able to find that special kind of mix of messages across platforms. I think second is flexibility. You know, she started off with a green lipstick, doing challenges, that was popular for a while. As her audience grew, she realized she had to change as they grew, and she also had to look inside um, and find what she was passionate about, and has transitioned to more of a lifestyle blogger, talking about her role as a mom, her fertility struggles, and has really come into her own voice, and I think that's the third part, is really having that strong voice I mean, this panel is a great example of that, of knowing what your story is and knowing what you're passionate about speaking, or video, or music, or whatever it might be, um, and staying true to that voice. Um, I think for me, I mean, uh, being at BuzzFeed, um, similarly, we don't get to choose our partners, but I'm lucky in that. Uh, well, first, we think about tech uh, and like service to editorial and service to content, um, and uh, I'm lucky in that we have great partners who've spent a bunch of time uh, experimenting, working together. Like as you say, they didn't start with 96 boys, but um, over the last few years, uh, you know, have really gained this expertise. They know like, what they're doing. Um, I, I do have an example of uh, making a mistake there. The startup I worked with, uh, we partnered with a another early YouTube like YouTuber to make content that. Uh, went viral, but the reason it didn't work out is because um, it was just the wrong partner, wrong audience, wrong um, sort of personality in terms of like the way they uh, produce the content relation to us, um, great people. Um, uh, yeah, so it just takes time, experimentation, and um, experience, I guess. It's a relationship. Yeah. And it's a relationship, and any good relationship takes time, and it's, 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 it's important to you when you invest in it. And that is where you feel safest, where you can let your hair down, where you can, they can see, people can make mistakes and feel that they won't be um, destroyed. You know, it's like, okay, this is an experiment. Let's experiment and see what happens. Let's throw something on the wall and see if it, if it works. Doing it all the time. Um, and Technology, and we haven't talked about this, makes the cost of experimenting so fractional that it's easier to experiment now than it ever was if I had to have a camera crew. I mean, a, a real. I mean, I use my my iPhone, you know, <laughs> and I'm the camera on my laptop uh, for my podcast or whatever. Um, it's got, the cost of being great as marginalized as marginalized people in these communities has been so, we, we are equal. As, as long as I have an internet and a laptop, I can be anywhere in the world. And where else, where, what other time has this been like that? And we need to, more of us need to take advantage of that. Um, and that comes from, you know, the lifestyle brand of, I'm a travel blogger, you know, and I just take my laptop and my phone and, and I just go wherever that, I just, you know, think about, you just show up at the airport and get on a flight. That's, that's your show. You get on a flight and wherever you go, you'll buy clothes when you get there and you're going to talk about that. That's what your vlog is going to be about. That's something interesting and something that most people couldn't have done before all of this happened. You said something interesting. You said you talked about relationships. Mm -hmm. I actually want to transition on that. I want to talk about the relationships with your audience. So. Talk to me a little bit about how you turn this digital content and your social media strategies into actual audience action. How do you take that from we're sharing something with you to driving them to do something that you want them to do? Wait, you can't. Yes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> she can't answer first. Um, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Okay, I think for me, uh, one of the products I work on, one of the brands I work on, uh, is the Tasty brand. And one of the things that we did uh, over the last year was launch uh, digital properties, so web, uh, an Android app, which is new, so please download it, and uh, an iOS app. And we really thought a lot about what utility people were taking from uh, that content that it just lived on social, and it lived on YouTube, and it lived on Facebook. Um, and we saw how people were commenting, um, saw how people were reacting, saw people were making this content, and so that informed the way that uh, we designed certain features. So it was step-by-step -step mode so that, um, you know, we, we fulfill that desire of folks to like make these meals. Um, you know, we listened to uh, people's input and decided we could accept some ratings because people would email us and say, hey, like, I really want to talk about this recipe. Um, so I think it's just about uh, studying your audience, seeing what they're doing, seeing how they behave from like, a more technical standpoint, see where they live on these properties, um, and then trying to give them what you think they want, and if you're wrong, like, try them. One of the ways YouTube or YouTube is doing this is really about thinking about ways we can kind of give back to creators on the platform, and that is by giving them more opportunities to monetize their content. So currently, most creators make most of their money through the ads revenue that we sell um, on the platform, but we're really trying to think of ways that they can tap into their communities to help grow their businesses. So things like our membership feature, where creators, like I manage a brand called Brave Wilderness, where they've had to go off platform and create kind of a fan club model. We're bringing that onto YouTube so they can tap into our reach of 1.9 billion users to help generate you know, fan clubs directly on the platform. Or things like we have a feature called Super Chat for Good, where a bunch of our gaming creators who do live chats are now able to have sponsored posts and they donate that money to charities. And so raising money for the causes they care about directly on the platform is a way they can connect with their community and give back at the same time. Um, <clears throat> one thing I noticed is that, you know, again, when it was new, when like, Instagram was brand new or the social networks was new, and my point of view is from an artist's perspective, I sell music primarily. I remember seeing people with like 50 million followers and that album come out they wouldn't sell 50 million dollars. Yeah. And I'll be like, I don't understand that. Yeah. And it's a difference though between how many people gonna watch you or follow you for free mm -hmm. versus how many people gonna follow the link to iTunes or to Google Play or to the title and go outside the platform support. And so I think that you got people watching and you got people that's mobilized. In my, in my field. And what we want to do is get as many of those people that are watching mobilized. And I think what's been um, successful or effective has been the best quality content. It's going, the people will mobilize behind the highest quality content. You know what I mean? If you are dramatically better than everything else that you're getting on IG or on YouTube or on whatever the platforms are, if your content is, you know, a lot better, visibly clearly better. In my experience, it translates better. Some artists, when they when they tweet, they link for their album. They got stats, and you get numbers back. And out of the two hundred thousand sales they did in their first week, one hundred eighty was off of that one link. Mm -hmm. And that's that's big that you put a, a, a link up, and one hundred eighty thousand people get behind the support out of your two hundred thousand that bought it. And then some artists put a link up, and they get. 10,000 sales and everything else happens on the stream. And so, understanding the difference, what motivates those, the people behind this type of content to buy it, and what motivates the people behind this not to, and it's just, you know, engage passively. Um, my theory is that it's just the quality of the content. You know what I mean? And, and it's almost like, it had a reverse effect on, on, on the arts because it started making art better because you, you realize that you can't, you know, flex it hard with the market that you could before. <laughs> yeah. That you got some good shit that just come out and catch fire. And so it kind of inspired artists to re reassess how they go about it also. I just feel like, you know, I'm just doing my best type of work because it's, it's proven that that's what they end up winning going on. And, um, 
I don't know if I answered that one either, but I hope I got to the point, you know? Don't question it. You can ask some right, cool. questions. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I took the mic from you. Yeah, you did your damn job. Don't come after me. I hate you. Black woman. <laughs> I want to jump off you because that's why I could care less about how many followers I have. Right. <laughs> what works for me is white guilt. <laughs> and I use it a lot. Um, yeah, because I recognize that what I'm doing is social justice change. So I have people in the funnel at different places. And I have, there are people who are, who, white people who've never seen this stuff before and they're offended right off the bat. So they know not to say nothing. They're just going to be still. And because my thing is, for the first 30 days, just follow folks that are saying something that you need to learn. After 30 days, you get to like. After 30 more days, you get to retweet. After 30 days, you get to retweet with comments. And then you might have an opinion. Um, so with that, I know that there are certain people in the community, when I say, because I pay my speakers, when I say, hey, I got this conference coming up, I'm going to London next week, um, I need so many more speakers to apply. They're sending out tweets, they're tapping their networks, they're doing that thing. When I say, hmm, end of the year coming up, and I, I need about $5,000 more dollars, y'all. I put out my 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 um, my email for LinkedIn, Twitter, and TransferWise, and I expect to get that money. Because if I don't, I will be like, well, well, I'll be damned. <laughs> I've been working. What do y'all do? I don't do this for free. And after enough shame and enough guilt. Oh, because I put whiteness in all caps. <sighs> I get my money. I get whatever I need. I get network. I get whatever I need. Well, you just don't know how freeing that is. I, tell you, I feel like a slave at emancipation. <laughs> Woo, yes, because I am using what they've always used against us. Against them. <laughs> get my money, and yeah, I'm getting my money. I have a client, and I'm not going to say who it is, but I have a client here in the Minneapolis area who experiences a white woman who's experienced some, some difficulties in her women, uh, her women tech group. And um, her first assignment was to buy a ticket to this conference because I wanted her to experience an event that was not planned for her comfort. You know, for the first time, you're going to be at a place that was not planned for you. So tell me how that feels. And she paid me well. You know? So that's how I get it. Because the white guilt is only to get them to move. Because they don't, they're so afraid. They don't know. They're making mistakes. Today. It's okay. We're trying to create a world that was never meant to exist. We go by the Constitution, we all should be slaves. I have a follow-up to that. Slaves? No. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Virginia, had no yes. slaves. Yes. Um, so when you're talking about your audience and you're talking about how you get them to do the things you want them to do, how do you react when they move and shift and react in a way that is unexpected? Whether it's good or bad, like what happens when your audience surprises you? How do you sort of take the reins back on that? Depends on what that surprise is. So, um, if they're in, so they know we're not even talking monetary. So, as I said, if I'm engaging with someone, I'm doing it for their benefit, and then they will come in and you know, if the person just doesn't get it, so they're trying to explain. But they often step in it, and the individual starts to see them as the expert. And I have to stop that, because I'm the expert. 
um, because they're e they would easily give a credit, my content, to other white folks and say, well, thank you for being nice to me because she wasn't nice. I don't have to be nice to you. You came in my timeline. I'm saying what I need to say, but I'm always angry. No, I'm not angry. I just disagree with you. Or you are ignorant, and I'm trying to um, educate you on what this conversation is about. So on those moments, I call them out, and they know I will. But when they've done something exemplary, I also call that out, and I highlight that. And I, because we, uh, I'm an educator, right? So hold it for a second. Yeah, okay. So my philosophy is stop doing that. This is why we're going to stop doing that, and this is what we're going to do instead. That's how my classroom management was. So that's how I treat my audience. Stop. Why you need to stop, this is what we're going to do instead. <laughs> so I don't have the mic, otherwise I just tell you how much I like you. Yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm super curious about that, like all the way across the board, because you all, I mean, in music in your audience surprises you, is that that could be, and particularly when it comes to content creation and your, and your dealings sort of on a large scale, on a corporate scale. If your audience surprises you, sometimes that could be great and be, you know, a huge uptick, or that could be you didn't expect the negative reaction that you got. How do you readjust? Um, I think you just try and learn and, and try again, right? Like, um, uh, I think one thing that uh, Bussy has been really good at is testing the waters. Um, reading, reading the waters and readjusting, and there have certainly been things that uh, have been huge successes. I'm sure we were surprised that just started as, you know, someone baking a cake and seeing how that like performed on YouTube, uh, and then I'm sure there are things that um, have been disappointing and then uh, learning points for the company and uh, content creators. Um, I think all you can do is just. Like move forward in good faith and, uh, and can try. Yeah, I think it goes back to that flexibility I talked about before. So a couple of examples. Um, DreamWorks TV is a partner who I manage. They were creating tons of content based on their existing IP, but found their comments on YouTube would often be about nonsensical, nothing related to what they were creating. And so they actually created a show called Your Comments Come to Life, where they took those silly comments and actually started a program a series around it that's been very popular. Or similarly, another studio created kind of a glossy TV style show that just didn't work on YouTube. And what they found worked better was actually tapping into some endemic um, YouTube creators. So this is Warner Brothers as an example. To celebrate Superman's 90th anniversary, they ended up actually working with one of our top gaming creators, Jerome ASF, and creating a series around kind of Superman fandom. Um, so it's really about just kind of adjusting and again, knowing your platform and being able to make the content that works for the audience. Um, I'll give an example. I had an album that I put out, well, a mixtape I put out, and um, it was at a time when I was taking um, meetings with major record labels. I was fully independent still at this time. And I was just strategizing with my team what route we was going to go, if we were going to stay independent, if we were going to try to go back into a uh, major level agreement. And we took meetings with everybody. We had offers on the table, and we had this project that was done. And if we done the deal, we was going to put the album we had done out as the first release from this partnership. We decided not to do the deal. And um, I remember thinking, I want to make sure that this release is bigger than it would have been if I had done the deal. So I was just thinking about how I could just make an impact. And what we did was we decided to sell it for $100. We, we decided to sell a hard copy of the CD for $100, include a concert uh, with the purchase. It was an exclusive concert, so you couldn't buy tickets elsewhere. You had to buy the album in its physical format. And um, on the digital side of it, it was on all platforms. So if you was programmed to consume music on iTunes, it was on iTunes. It was on Spotify. But then it was also on the mixtape websites for free. It was also on SoundCloud, it was also on YouTube. So it was an untraditional release, and we got criticized really bad at the beginning for the first two or three days. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, no, excuse me, for the first 
three days before released, I announced it, mm -hmm. and we had a pre-sale link up. And two things happened. One thing, happened, one of the things that happened was PayPal hit me because we started making a lot of sales, and they suspended my shit and said you got exposed to growth. It's a nice fraud going on. Getting <laughs> out of transaction and keep we keep seeing on your thing. And then also Jay Z reached out and bought a hundred copies of the album at a hundred dollars each and sent ten thousand to us. And also put it on his website. He took a picture, put it on his IG, and it became a big thing. So. Um, I think that's two examples of the audience um, not showing up for the, for the you know, preliminary couple of days when they was uh, critiquing the idea. And then a, a part of my audience, whoever was paying attention, that tip Jay-Z off to it, maybe himself, standing up and supporting it. Um, but yeah, it was just a, a moment where the audience was kind of, I, I was kind of watching them and curious to see that, how they were going to react. I got both reactions. but. Ended up being a big success that um, kind of distinguished me as an independent music brand, you know? Yeah. I'm going to shift a little bit of the conversation to help the audience because I know they're here, they learn from you, but I also like it when really smart people can get really good, solid advice. Can you tell the audience members, well, first of all, I have one very specific question around that. What's the biggest mistake that you see individuals and brands doing with their digital strategy? Not having strategy. Again, that difference between intention, um, and, and, and I drilled that with my students, just because I, I want to be a doctor, but I'm not taking science classes. Um, it's that I want to be I want to have a, a YouTube, you know, be a YouTube creator. What are you doing? If this is free information on them. What are you doing to learn? What are you doing? To, and then they make something and it doesn't go viral right away because everything's supposed to go viral right away. And then it's demand, it's the other thing. It's no, it's what did you do? Now, uh, my, there is some of that, but once you, you can ask that question, ask, ask those questions once you know you've gotten your craft together and you've done what you and you've thought about, that's a great idea. And it also shows how PayPal is not listening to the customers to, to, for something for them to shut you off like that. And that's a problem. Right. Um, and so it's about not having that strategy. And, that, and then once you have that strategy, working that strategy. But also, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. We are in this, I mean, you see someone and you just, we just keep assuming it happened yesterday. People are working hard. This is just like you go to your nine to five every single day. We're working more than nine to five. Sure. I mean, I don't know what a nine to five, I'm sometimes like, what day is it? <laughs> you know, and this is, that's just the consistency we talked about. But yeah, that, that you have to have a strategy, not you're gonna burn out and there's so many, there are enough walls against us then for us to put barriers in front of ourselves. We need to remove our own barriers so we have the strength to deal with all that stuff that's out there. You all right? I think so, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I think uh, just to echo what you're saying, because, um, you know, a lot of people have goals and don't have a plan. Um, uh, and I, I mentioned earlier, you know, we have the luxury of having thin skin. Uh, failing the first time should be um, the thing that discourages you. Failing the second, or the third, or the fourth time should be the thing that discourages that discourages you. Excuse me. Um, I think uh, I think there should be a focus on uh, understanding where you want to end up, but also defining how you're going to get there and adjusting. Like when things go wrong, try again, but don't try the exact same thing. Yeah. I agree with both of my fellow um, panelists, but I would just also say that the digital one-size-fits-all model just really doesn't work. I think your case study is perfect for showing you have different audiences on each platform and then being able to serve them uniquely is critical. Um, yeah, I think being flexible and like, you know, I heard that everybody's response to a degree just being, being able to reassess and re-approach based on what you experience. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying. One thing I want to say, though, when we talk about mistakes, we live in a culture that teaches us that mistakes are wrong. 
Um, and that's why I tell them, I used to tell them, I hated young people. I'm just sorry. I like juniors and seniors. I like the kids who are about to go out and don't have a clue. Because then they're really ready and hungry to hear what I have to say. Because I'm not going to tone this down, so you're going to get your fit. You can't have thin skin with me. So, it's, we in the educational system teaches that mistakes are wrong. Because if you make mistakes, your grade point average goes down. All the, I mean, there are negatives to that. In tech, that's how we innovate. And so there has to be a huge paradigm shift with people being comfortable. I don't even, I don't see them as failures. They, no, I don't see them as mistakes. They are failures. But a failure is not a, a death sentence. And that's what we grow up to be. Our parents, you know, you gotta do this, you gotta be right. No, you, people need to be able to experiment, the safety of experimentation. And we don't do that enough in our communities. And we really need to do more of that in our communities. We need to let our young people fail um, in a safe environment where we can get, they feel safe and they can get up. And we still go, you, you good? Now keep going. So they can get used to it. Because that's what white people have been doing. We have missed that. I, I, and I'm going to say this. Civility is, is, is um, optional for white people. It is our expected behavior. So we've been managing, if we can manage our own behavior, then they don't have to worry about us. We need to stop being so civil and going out there and ask, asking first and then demanding what we need. And that comes from making those mistakes and saying, you know what, there's nothing wrong with me because mistakes are what we do. But I can learn from that. Now, before we wrap up, I want to give the audience a chance to ask a few questions because I understand. We have time for three questions. So, is that gentleman right there in the middle, you put your hand up. Let's get to you. Uh, this question is for Alexis, but I guess the other folks can answer it if you'd like. I'm really curious about uh, brands that are uh, promoting their material on YouTube going viral, and the uh, influx of also streaming platforms, everybody's got a streaming pla platform, right? every channel, or just every, every network, and even YouTube has YouTube originals. Where's that line that, uh, I guess for YouTube to say, or even decide, okay, this is a brand that we want to bring in, or maybe consume, or let them be independent and let them be viral? or bring them on board to, to be an original? What, what's kind of like that fine line? I think the original strategy is slightly different. I mean, first, any brand can exist on YouTube. That is the beauty of it being an open platform. But how that brand grows is one signal that we take in to understand what is the popularity of that brand. In terms of our original strategy, that's really about building out our YouTube premium service, so the paid service where people can get access to certain features as well as YouTube originals. So there we're really catering more towards specific audiences, whether it's a general audience, a sitcom type show, a show that appeals to men 18 to 34, or whatever it may be. Those stories really are shaped around the audience needs that we have with the service. All right, next question. Let's see a hand down here. Um, I got a question for Nib. Um, by the way, your music helped me out a lot in life, like with from like Marathon, Slawson Boy, Mailbox Money, yeah. everything. Like the game motivation to like keep going in life. So like I know at times we kinda get like to a point where can I make more music? I'm kinda stuck. So how do you like give yourself more motivation to keep going instead of being stagnant? Um I think you you, you have creative ways. In my experience, moments you can be really creative and really productive, and in other moments where you don't be on your A game as much. But I think showing up every day and working through it, mm -hmm. I think when you when you feel like you can only work when you inspire, that's not the right mentality. I think you gotta just work. And then you get blessed with moments where everything sounds great, and then you get moments when it don't, but you show your commitment by working through it, you know what I mean? So that, that's my strategy. Yeah. All right, awesome. And I did have a third hand down here that already was raised. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this question is about the youth who, uh, how, to, how, to, how to explain this. Uh, 
So, so for people growing up in the hood or in certain areas that, that aren't able to sort of relate to, I'm just be straight up, like the two of you in the middle, kind of a little different from the two on the outside. <laughs> in, in a way, it's where how I, trans, how I interpret what you're saying makes more sense. The way, the way you speak makes more sense to me. The way you speak, Nipsey, makes more sense to me. And if Nipsey put a stamp on you, I would, list, I would pay more attention to you, but he would have to put a stamp on you. So like, and, and, I, and I have people that I grow up with that could relate okay, to that. Why, why would you say that? I just had a curiosity, just based on, and I'm not, I'm not judging, I just yeah. want some clarity. Yeah. What makes you say that, that it would take a stamp for me to receive what she had to say? Regardless of what she said, if she said something that made sense, it would take for me to stub it. Cause, 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 cause you were you, you were influencer. Right. All right. So, so, so. Are you familiar with what? what before I came in, are you familiar with what I've done, maybe? So yeah. you kind of got the context for me. Yes, sir. Through the music. Yeah, yeah. I'm from Rialto, California. Gotcha. I keep up with you. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, so for the youth to, to connect. Pop back real quick. <laughs> so my question is, <laughs> so my question is connecting it to the youth, to the youth who, who see who may see the two of you as uh, so-called square. Or, or I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm really not. I'm really not. We get it. Okay, Go ahead. Okay. We get it. How, how, how would you guys Let brand? Be honest. How would you guys brand yourself? And, and, and it could be the same as you, kind of connecting it, connecting the middle. But how, how would you? How would you get reach people like me who think that, man, you're successful? Um, but but but. But you don't you see the bridge saying? between it, where you are to where they yeah, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> see, that's okay, what he doesn't you. see the bridge so. to where he is to where you are. It's, it's not, he's not criticized, he just doesn't see the bridge. I totally understand. Yeah. Um, I think earlier I mentioned a few years of Washington, which is in Los Angeles. I used to live in um, uh, Loma Linda. I used to work in that cafeteria at that children's hospital. Yeah. Not too far from Rialto. Yeah. Um, I guess first, like I would say, Today it's kind of cool to be square. Um, you know, I, I think um, and I, and, uh, and, uh, uh, I guess I don't mean that. I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, yeah. What I mean to say is that um, it's okay that there are different ways for Black people to move in the world. Um, and you know, the idea that uh, the idea that there like, there is no real difference. We like. When I speak, maybe someone might understand me differently, but I still get pulled over, I still get followed in stores. Um, and, um, and my name is Shama like <laughs> to the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, now you can drop the money. Yeah, exactly. That's a good thing. So, you know more about it. I'm going to add is, you know, I also am from Oakland, right. you know, in the yeah. projects with okay. a single mother and um, yeah. other difficult circumstances. Is the reason I come and speak at events like this is to show that you can come from anywhere yeah. and still be successful and work out. That's, 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 that's what I need to know. Because I can, I can, I, you know, it's like you, 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 you just. You know, you let you, you told me who you were, where you came from, and so like I can I can I, I can digest it a little bit better. Well, it, it's also that's why I tell more. We need more minorities, more people on the stage, so you can see us. And, and this is this is why you can't relate. Um, I have a master's degree. I'm getting a doctorate. I'm writing a book. So it's all we're all here. Um, but I probably talk like your mama or somebody. Yeah. Just like, boy, go somewhere, sit down. Yeah. Um, but that's why we need us on the stage so that people like you don't have to not see the bridge. Yeah. And this is where people are like, oh, we keep trying, we keep trying, we can't. We're not, we're not trying in ways that mean anything. Having white people up here does not help us. You need to be able to see somebody from your community has working with someone, a, a company, a global brand. And, and that's why they want you guys to, when you start talking with him, he was being honest. He was speaking his heart. You know, I don't see it. But you need to see that. And you need to see, every, and that's why we're not catching the, our community, because they can't see it. 
they think we've done some, I mean, we work hard, but I, my hustle and your hustle are the same. Now, my hustle ain't the same as the Kardashians. Right. We ain't getting this, I'm working, but we ain't getting the same results. Right. But my hustle and your hustle is the same. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, if make it really quick. Last one. Just a quick question from you two and everybody else in this ass. I'm just curious of your thoughts of the future of streaming platforms. I got the info. Nah, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to predict. Honestly, I think that it's going to continue to change. I know I didn't expect streaming to kill the digital download that fast. <laughs> I, I, I thought it would take some time. Yeah. Um, but I feel like music is going to be worth more money in the future than it is now. I feel like more people have access to the music. I feel like people will build business models that make the music industry work a lot more money than it's worth now. Because since streaming, the music industry has got bigger. Everybody has not been compensated properly and it hasn't crept its way all the way down to the creators yet. But the industry is growing, it's getting bigger. So I think it's a, it's, it's a positive future. And we headed into, um, you know, uh, an abundant time of music, that's what I think. And content in general, because it's streaming. Yeah. All right. No secrets. No secrets. No secrets. All right. All right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Please give a round of applause.